What's up, Copy Squad? Kyle Milligan of KyleTheWriter.com here, and we are about to jump into part three of the Heat Seekers promo breakdown. Now, if you haven't seen part one and two, go back, check those out, and get all caught up. We covered the headline, we got over the lead, and now we're running into the body copy of this promo. Now, in this video, I'm going to be a little more critical of the copy than I was previously. I'm specifically going to point out a couple things that I thought were really hurting the copy and slowing it down, and areas I think could improve. So you should be able to take away uh, a lot of good tips from that. So let's go ahead and get started. All right, so now we're talking about the body copy. We've talked about the headline. We broke down things that we thought were important to really grab them by the eyeballs, get them excited, build their intrigue, flag your ideal prospect, and then we transitioned into the lead. And in the lead, we're learning about is this for you? Can you make a ton of money? All you're really doing in the lead is building up that excitement. So you're making basically like a giant like seven page promise. It says page four of 30, but we're kind of on page like seven at this point because I have this kind of scaled down. And leads usually are about seven or eight pages long. If you find that your lead before you start getting into your body and like if it goes over seven, it's too damn long. If it's only like three or four, that can be done. There's different ways to do it and stuff. But generally, this is the uh, tried and true uh, stuff. So we're going to body copy now. So this is where it's going to be a lot of that formula I was showing you earlier. At this point, you in a lead, you kind of do everything you need to set the groundwork to make someone ready to buy. Now at this point, they're like, okay, I, I, am, I want to buy this. But, and that's all body copy is. I want to buy this, but. So um, what you're going to see is, shoot, darn it. You're going to see this over and over until basically we get to the offer. Watch this pattern. I want to buy this, but. Okay. See these formulas? These are sabermetric calculations. In reality, there are 230 in total. Together, they can tell you anything and everything you want to know about any baseball player from this walk percentage, blah, blah, blah. But out of all these calculations, one of them reigns supreme, our magic bullet. It is the most well-known, influential, and respected metric in baseball today. It's called war. All right, we've named the magic bullet. I'm going to try to slow down my scrolling and talking because it seems to mess up my camera. In baseball, war stands for wins above replacement. It's a single number that tells you how many additional wins a baseball player is worth to his team. Just to give you a rough idea, the average full-time MLB player has a war of 2. Bench players have a war typically between 0 and 1. All-stars have between 4 and 5. MVPs have 6 or higher. Okay, cool. So now we're getting more insight into it. It's uh, So I think your first thing would be like, okay, I want to buy this, but this sounds like a bunch of baloney. Okay, well, no, it's not baloney. It's science. Listen to me. Here it comes. All right, so he's explaining... He's explaining the science. All right, here we go. But it would take me hours to explain the math that goes into computing a player's war. You have to measure all of his on-field contributions, his abilities, add adjustments, those contributions. I don't have time to explain all that, and neither do you. That's right. You can't do this yourself. Just let me do all the work for you. Um, here's an easy way to look at it. Higher the war is, higher his contribution, higher his contract price should be. Mike Trout from the Los Angeles Angels, for example, has a war of eight this season, making him worth eight additional wins to his team. He also costs $34 million. Okay. So what he's proving at this point is that war is a legitimate thing, and he's doing that by saying this baseball player has a high war, and he gets high money. He's kind of making that analogy right here. Divide that out, and Mike Trout's worth $4.2 million per game. Okay, this is called a reframe. When you get big numbers like that, you kind of want to figure out a way to make them smaller or to reframe them a different way to emphasize them or to make them more graspable, tangible, more... F Blake Snell, Tampa, here it comes. A war rating. Snell's contract is his... Okay. Okay, cool. So, Blake Snell, Tampa Bay Rays, has a war of 5.3, making him worth five additional wins. His contract is 558000 a year. 
His cost per war is around 105, which is 40 times less than Mike Trout. Okay, so this is like another piece of proof that the war can predict contract value. So I ask you, I ask you, reasonable thinking person, right? He set it up like it would be unreasonable to disagree. Which player is going to give you more bang for your buck, Mike Trout or Blake Snell? If you answered Blake Snell, then you understand war. Identifying players, identifying players like Snell with a high war and low cost per war is exactly how Billy Bean became a legend. Since Bean took over as manager to A's, the team has won 180 more games. than expected <clears throat> based on a salary for each player. Uh, this gives Bean a war of 180, making him more valuable than the greatest players of all time. He's exceeded expectations by 1.3 billion. Okay, so he said a big number, and then he gives you a graphic. It's kind of like a way to reframe it. Again, I'm not telling you this for kicks and giggles. So that would be like three pieces of proof. Generally, when you get the uh, objection claim ben uh, proof benefit, you get three pieces of proof in there. Let me go up and write that in for you. So in case you download this PDF, I want you to be able to like look at it without me talking, and it makes sense. Okay, and none of this is set in stone, but you're going to see it's going to kind of do exactly what I said. Because the next line, oh, shit. The next line was, stop. I'm not telling you this for kicks and giggles. I'm telling you this because, just like Billy Bean, I too love war. Um, so, he's alluding to a benefit coming. Difference is, I use war to identify the most underrated, underexposed, unappreciated. There you are. You're going to see this repeated, I can already tell you. Not in baseball, but in the stock market. Haven't taken a loss on a single trade. That's the benefit. Bam! Does that mean I'll never recommend a loser? Well, I'm not God. I can't make promises like that. That's called legal. Now, if you don't have a legal team, you might want to add that to your copy. I don't know. But for us, we try not to, and then legal punches a million of them in there. Uh, Let's see, there's always risk when you're investing. It's all legal shit. Yes, I'm undefeated, but just like Conor McGregor or Ron Rousey, I'm also human. I could take a hit. It could happen. That's cool. I like how they kind of tied it back to their target audience with Conor and Ronda. However, I've dedicated my life to finding only winning stocks, and I've done extremely well so far. Ask yourself, how many hotshot investors, analysts, hedge fund blowhards do you know who can say they haven't taken a loss on a single trade? I'll tell you how many. None. This is the only person who can do this for you. But I can. Today, I don't spend a second of my life worrying about what the market is doing, who the president is, or how many bozos are out there protesting on the streets about free lunches and gender-neutral bathrooms. All I care about is war. I guess he's trying to be ironic here. Uh, and if you want to learn how to become undefeated like me, never forget what I'm about to tell you. It's a really great way. All right. Um, all right, so one of the cool things about breaking stuff down like this is you you, you are obviously recognizing the patterns, but at the same time, you want to kind of think and, and pull the, your favorite parts of promos out. And I think this is the second time he's done something like this where instead of just telling you, I'm about to tell you something, he says, never forget what I'm about to tell you. Earlier, he said, get out a pen or paper, do whatever you can to get this information down. That is... A really clever way, like the, the stupid, well, I won't say stupid, but the classic way of doing it is in just a moment, I'm going to reveal 10 ways you can make a bajillion dollars. Okay, that's what most people do. This is a cleverer way to say, if you want to learn how to become undefeated like me, never forget what I'm about to tell you. This also gives you the element of loss. So I feel like there's a in, in, in like, how do you say it? It's like insinuated that you're going to miss out if you don't listen to this. Never forget this. Like, pay attention right now. Instead of just learning how to become undefeated, never forget what I'm about to tell you. Kind of says, 
If you don't, you're gonna miss out. So um, this is one of those things that I would want to put like uh, like if I was to be taking like side notes, like kind of like this. Um, this is a great transition. Why is my writing like that? All right, let's get this um, to be about to tell you. Now, in copywriting, it is really bad um, etiquette to like steal someone's copy. You don't want to do that. But what you can do is you can pull apart what makes that work. Is what we're kind of trying to do here is reverse engineer it and say, "Wow, that's a really powerful line because it sets me up to know instead of just using like a really typical." transition that I can I can emphasize that what's coming is really important this way. So don't steal, don't plagiarize copy. Ooh, try not to steal copies, all I'm trying to say. Don't be a dick. Uh, just like in baseball, if a company has a war of six or more, it's an MVP player, an all-star stock. In a few minutes, I'll tell you how I calculate war. But first, I'd like for you to take a look at these two charts. First one is Six Flags Entertainment which is one of the biggest amusement park operators in America. The other is First American International, a tiny financial firm that provides loans to Chinese Americans in New York City. These two companies couldn't be any more different from one another, and yet both of them had a war of seven. More specifically, Six Flags had a war of 7.6. First American had 6.96. With roughly the same war, you'd expect both these stocks to produce the same gains. But as you see, that is not what happened. Six Flags has gone up 63, while First American soared like a bald eagle, going up 270%. Wow, that's so corny. I bet in the VSL, too, this dude milks it. I bet he sounds like, uh, I don't want really to insult him, but I bet he sounds retarded. Uh, Six Flags has been up 63%, this one up 270 Okay, so is it because one's cheaper than the other? Uh, uh, he knew what I was going to ask. So why did one company produce returns four times higher? It has to do with their cost per war. Yep, that's it. Uh, six flags of cost per war. American had 0.86, which is less. The stock was practically a giveaway. Okay, so to pay for a war, it costs a lot less. So again, Okay, this is what I like to call uh, the layman's explanation. They always do this in a uh, system promo, which is what we have here. We have a system. Um, in in back ends, when you have a new novel way to make money, it's typically this magic bullet, which is also a system that this person has developed, and he's the only person in the world with the ability to use the system because it's proprietary to him. He discovered it watching baseball. And every person is going to have some sort of angle like that when it comes to a system back-end promo. Uh, so the, they always go into, okay, so how do I do this? So they started with this one. Here's where I kind of learned about it. He, he gave you a – he proved that it works. It's viable. He proved that earlier. And I was further proving that here, um, but he's going a step further. Instead of just showing you charts the first time, which is what most system promos do, and I, I think if, if it were me, I'd probably have gotten to the gains a lot quicker. Um, but he's expanding upon it, okay? Our publisher, Joe Schrafer at Agora, says the magic show must get better. It's like one rule of magicians is you can't come out with your best trick and then have like a bunch of minor tricks. You got to start with a minor trick and you build up to like the finale, just like a fireworks show. So he told you it's viable. Then he told you like this is how we use it to predict and calculate on these gains. Um, so first you're gonna get like a I'm getting off topic. First you're gonna get the layman's explanation of cost per war. Then what I'm anticipating is he's going to give you a um, this doesn't make any sense to you because you're not super smart as me explanation, which would be like your technical explanation. That's what I'm anticipating will be the next section, and I'm interested to see how he's gonna step that up because he's got to make the magic show get better. So um, right here also I want to see one other thing. Does he say he made any gains off this? That's something I'm also noticing. So this is something I would draw out from the copy because one of the hard parts is proving like how much money the, the guru has made, the stock trader themselves. But if this guy is just showing you examples, right, does he say I made this money? Let's see. If a company has war of six or more, it's an all-star stock. But if its cost per war is less than one, it means you can also buy that all-star stock for pennies on the dollar. 
This is why I haven't closed a single losing trade. Okay, so this is the next thing he's going to have to prove. So we're going to see some, some more graphs, uh, probably three to six. I only look for companies with a war of six or higher and a cost per war of less than one. So now we understand it. Our dumb brains can comprehend your amazing system. Look at Sanderson Farms. All right, I'm calling it here. Three to six examples. Sanderson Farms. <clears throat> I love fried chicken. Sanderson Farms, a household name, literally. Products line my freezer. All right, we get it. They also happen to be the third largest poultry producer. Company in a war of 14. Holy crap. Cost of war of 1.8. Stock is now 63%, which isn't bad. But on that very same day, June 7, a tiny no-name company called American Bank Corp a war of 12.6, cost per war of 0.8, which is below 1 and far lower than the cost per war of Sanderson's farm. So I recommended the company to anyone who would listen. American, Amer Mariana Bank Corp. It shot up 108%. Boom. So money. Now let's talk about Pepsi. Uh, so he said, I recommended. That's, that's important. That's important uh, because if he says he recommended, well, it means he recommended. It doesn't mean like uh, it happened. It's more powerful. So that's all that means. That's what I'm trying to say. Let's talk about Pepsi. Unless you've been living in a bunker, I don't need to tell you how popular a company Pepsi is. Uh, coming at war 10, cost per war at 1.6, went up 18%. I don't know why he's telling us about this. The very same day, I found GNV. Have you heard of them? No doubt. I haven't seen a single analyst cover this stock in my entire life. Compared to Pepsi, this company may as well have been an ant living in a giant crater, but it didn't matter to me. GNVC at a war of 8.9, cost per war 0.9, which again is one below is below one or far lower than Pepsi. So here we are, proof number two. It's going to shoot up 194%. Notice the gain stepped up. Last one was 108, 194. Remember, the magic show must get better, okay? Let's go. I hope they were listening. GNBC stock shut up like a rocket. Again, if you only target stocks the war six or higher, you'll likely always make money. I've seen it firsthand. Sorry about that. So he was saying, I've seen it firsthand. The company also has a cost per war of less than one. It's like being able to recruit Manny Machado for 10000 a year. An insane bargain. Cool. Tied it back to baseball. Uh, I found Northeast Bancorp. This tiny no-name stock has been around since 1872. Yet, as far as I can tell, only one analyst ever recommended them. Just one. The company had a war of 6.9, cost per war of 8, 0.8. Other words, all-star stock trading at a bargain bin price. So, like always, I told as many people as I could to buy shares. For their sake, I hope they listen. All right, 183%. So, what we got here, we had uh, 108, 194, and then we have, that seems to be working a lot better. Okay, so it wasn't a steady step up every single time, but it, uh, it definitely started with the lower end and then worked its way up. I stayed around there. I could do this for hours. By deliberately targeting... And that's also number three. By deliberately targeting stocks with a war of six or higher and a cost per war of less than one. Uh, I've managed to crush my competition like Godzilla on a rampage. Not only do I have 119 trades and zero losers, but my wins have been massive. Okay, I want to also point out something I noticed at the beginning, but I didn't want to say. Uh, 119 trades. So that doesn't mean winners. It doesn't mean 119 winners means he's got like all these open trades or if these are options he could let them expire they didn't really lose there's probably some sort of copywriting you know mumbo jumbo going on right here but maybe you can use that for, for your work